Today, we are going to start with a new topic under international business management, which is international entry strategies. Before we go further, let's have a quick recap on what we have covered so far. Previously, we have covered three topics under the foundation concept and theories of international business, which are an overview of international business and globalization, international financial system, and theories of international trade and investment. Additionally, we also covered three topics under the international business environment, which are cultural, political and legal, as well as economic. From today's topic onward, we will be covering various issues under international business management. Basically, we will be discussing and exploring how firms manage the international business, which are quite different in comparison to existing domestic businesses. So, we will cover topics such as what are the entry strategies, how to organize and manage international operations, how to market goods and services internationally, as well as how to manage international human resource. For today's topic, international entry strategies, there are four learning objectives. After this topic, you should be able to first describe how company use exporting entry strategy, second, describe the different types of contractual entry strategy, third, describe the various kind of investment entry strategy, and lastly, outline the key strategic factors in selecting an entry strategy. As this topic is all about international entry strategies, so what is an entry strategy? An entry strategy is a mode or channel that a firm uses to enter a foreign market. There are many entry strategies that are available to choose. Here, it shows an overview categories of entry strategy. There are three main categories, which are exporting, contractual, and investment. Under exporting strategy, there are direct and indirect export. Under the contractual entry strategy, there are licensing, franchising, management contract, manufacturing contract, and turnkey project. And for Investment entry strategy, they are wholly owned subsidiary, joint venture, and strategic alliances. Each of the entry strategy are different in terms of four aspects. First, control over foreign operation. This is whether firms have high or low control over their foreign operation. Second, resource required whether the entry strategy require high or low resources. Third, flexibility. This is the flexibility in terms of ease of withdrawal from foreign markets or foreign countries. And the last one, risk. How much risk occur from the entry strategy? Is it high or low? Now, we start with the first learning objective exporting entry strategy exporting is defined as the sale of products and services in foreign countries that are sold or produced in a home country so one important characteristic we can detect based on this definition is that only the product and services will be sold in the foreign countries whereas operation offices employees assets and other will be remain in the home country. As aforementioned, there are two types under exporting, which are direct and indirect exporting. For direct exporting, firms will have a higher degree of involvement because they are selling products directly to buyers in a target market. Bear in mind that Direct exporter need not to sell directly to the end user, 
but they are responsible for getting their goods into the target market by using intermediaries in the foreign or host countries. For an example, local foreign distributor or sales representative. On the other hand, indirect exporting usually used by companies that have few resources and indirect exporting also suitable for firms that have lack of contacts and experience in doing international business. So, firm will have lower degree of involvement because they will use third party to handle all the exporting process. That is, the firms only have to get their products ready and appoint any intermediaries such as agent, export management company or trading company in their own home country to perform all export function. Therefore, this is easier as the firms no need to worry on how to get their product into a foreign market. Both direct and indirect export have some similarities and differences. In terms of similarities, both are using intermediaries to get their product into a foreign market. Direct export using local sales representative and distributor, while indirect export use agent, export management company, or export trading companies. And the differences are in terms of the origin of the intermediaries. Direct export using intermediaries that are based in the host or foreign countries, whereas indirect export using intermediaries from their own home country. So, here is an example to show you a case of direct export. Mr. Jason runs a large snack company in Malaysia. He used direct exporting to enter the US market. So, he used local representative and distributor in the US to sell his product directly to the American customer. This is an example for indirect export. Ms. Ola runs a small company that's selling organic honey in Malaysia. She used agent, export management company or trading company in Malaysia to help her to export her products to the US. Therefore, the key differences are based on whether the intermediaries are in their own home country versus to foreign host country. So, we can sum up that under the export entry strategy, the control over foreign operation is low. This is because only the products are exported to the foreign countries, whereas all operation and management remain in the home country. This is also a disadvantage to the firms because they cannot control or take immediate action if anything bad happens with their products in the foreign countries. While a low control in exporting leads to disadvantages, low resources required in this entry strategy is the advantage of exporting. No setup of offices, factories, or transfers of assets are required. Therefore, the resources involved are very low. The cost only up to paying the intermediaries use. Another advantage is due to high flexibility of this entry strategy. Since the firms only have limited or no control over foreign operation and resources only in terms of intermediaries cost, the firm can quit from using this entry strategy anytime without worrying that they already have an office, a factory or some asset in the foreign countries. Simply said, the firms are not restricted by this entry strategy. Last is the most attractive advantage of this entry strategy is due to low risk. This entry strategy is particularly appealing to firm without any international business experience and limited resources because the risk by undertaking this entry strategy 
is the lowest among all entry strategy. Most company, regardless of sizes, favor this entry strategy because it requires lowest cost and entails lowest risk while maintaining high flexibility. The only drawback is that firms are unable to control their foreign operation. However, firms always use this entry strategy to gain international business environment and experience before using other higher level entry strategy in future expansion. Now, we will be exploring the types of entry strategy under the contractual category. The essential of a contractual agreement emphasizes on the exchange of intellectual property between two or more parties. So, there are five types of strategy under contractual entry category, which are licensing, franchising, management contract, manufacturing contract, and turnkey project. Here, we will be discussing on licensing and franchising contract. These two are very similar, but not the same. Licensing is a contractual agreement in which a company that owns intangible property, known as the licensor, grants another firm, known as the licensee, the right to use the property for a specific period of time. Based on this contract, licensor receive royalty payments based on a percentage of revenue generated by the property. Commonly licensed intangible property includes patent, copyrights, special formulas and design, trademark, and brand names. Examples are such as Marvel, Microsoft, Coca-Cola, and many more. Whereas for franchising, one company known as the franchiser supplies another firm known as the franchisee with intangible property and assistance over an extended period of time. Franchiser typically receive compensation as flat fees, royalty payment, or both. The brand name or trademark of a company is normally the single most important item desired by the franchisee. Examples are such as KFC, McDonald's, Subway, and many more. Here is a simple example of licensing, which is Marvel. I assume that most of you know about Marvel, right? Marvel is based in the US. It is one of the original comic book producers and has since 1939 created almost 8,000 characters, including Iron Man, Spider-Man, The Hulk, Thor, and many more. As holders of the intellectual property rights in the creative works, Marvel has been able to leverage the commercial value of its superheroes through various licensing agreements. For example, Marvel gives license to LEGO to manufacture toys based on their superheroes' character. Now for franchising. McDonald's origin from the US is one of the most successful fast food restaurants around the world. It has well-established and valuable trademark. It is an example of a brand franchise. Franchising only works well when a company has a strong and well-established brand name. Franchisor not only provide the brand, logo, and trademarks, but also recipe and operation to their franchisee. Here are some facts about McDonald's franchise businesses. Franchisee operate 90% of McDonald's restaurants in the US and about 81% of its restaurants worldwide. Around 38,000 restaurants to date and they serve almost 70 million customers per day. Around 35,000 of the 38,000 restaurants were franchised, 
and McDonald's only operating the remaining close to 2,800 restaurants. Here are some comparisons between licensing and franchising. In terms of business model, licensing is fairly common in manufacturing industry, which deal with goods and product. For an example, Marvel is a producer of comic books, but the firm licensed his Marvel characters to Lego so that Lego can produce toys based on superheroes' character. Whereas franchising is primarily used in service industry, and the common one is restaurant service, such as KFC, McDonald's, and others. For licensing, ownership of the product is with the licensee. Back to the Marvel and Lego example, the toy products produced by Lego will be belong to Lego, since the firm has purchased the right to manufacture toys based on the Marvel superheroes character. And for franchising, the ownership of the business also with the franchisee, since the firm has purchased the right to run the same business on behalf of the franchisor in exchange of royalty or fees. Here we will have a quick look on the advantages and disadvantages of licensing and franchising. In terms of advantages, licensor are able to expand into other markets without heavy capital investment, whereas licensee are able to access market with a strong brand name. Let us use the Marvel and Lego example again. Marvel able to expand into the toys market by granting Lego to produce toys using its superhero characters, whereas Lego able to sell the superhero characters easily as people know all about it. For franchising, franchises are able to access to so many marketplaces in the world, whereas franchisee get support from the franchisor to extend an already successful business model. Despite the advantages, there are some disadvantages too. Licensor does not have control over how the licensee use of its intellectual property. Under licensing, there is a heavy initial investment that franchisee has to fulfill in order to be granted the right to use the franchisor brand name and trademarks. Additionally, franchisee can experience a loss of organizational flexibility in franchising agreements. Next, we move to management and manufacturing contract. These two are quite similar in which both will be providing expertise or services to another firm. Under management contract, a firm will provide management expertise such as marketing, accounting, and others in all or specific area to another firm. Whereas under manufacturing contract, a firm will provide manufacturing services to produce product based on the specification of another firm. Let's have a look on the example of management contract based on the agreement between Heathrow Airport in the UK and Indianapolis Airport in the US. Heathrow Airport possess vast airport management skill and Heathrow operates the Indianapolis Airport under a 10-year management contract. It provides retail management at the Air Mall and Pittsburgh Airport. Here is an example of manufacturing contract between Apple Incorporation and Foxconn. Apple Incorporation, based in the US, has been using contract manufacturers to produce and assemble its product for many years. One of the appointed contract manufacturers, Foxconn, is producing Apple products in China. Now is the last type of contractual entry strategy, turnkey project. 
This refers to a project that in which clients such as government, non-government, companies and other pay contractors to design and build a facility or plant or building and turn the project over to the clients when it is done. Anyway, the name turnkey also refers that a client in which pays a flat fee for the project is expected to do nothing than simply turn a key to get the facility operating. This is just like how we start a car to get it moving. An example of company that involved in turnkey project is Bowie's, Le Bowie's Land Lease. It is one of the world leading project management and construction project company based in the UK. Our iconic Petronas Tin Towers is the example of turnkey project built by this company. So we can sum up that all aspects in terms of control over foreign operation, resources required, flexibility, and risk are moderate under the contractual entry strategy. This is because this entry strategy is governed and bounded by an agreement between two or more, two or more parties. Hence, each party involved will have their own degree of control, resources, flexibility, and risk. Okay, now we will be discussing the investment entry strategy. This strategy entails that the direct investment in plant and equipment in a foreign country coupled with ongoing involvement in the local operation. Anyway, investment entry strategy also commonly referred as foreign direct investment or in short, FGI. This is a complete opposite of exporting which for exporting, all the plant and equipment remain in the home country. Only the products will be traded and sold in the foreign country. There are three types under this strategy, which are wholly owned subsidiary, joint venture and strategic alliances. Under wholly owned subsidiary, firms, the firm owns 100% of the stock known as the parent firm. It can establish by forming a new subsidiary from the ground or by purchasing an existing company. Joint venture referred to a separate company is created and jointly owned by two or more independent entities to achieve an objective. For strategic alliances, two or more entities cooperate but do not form a separate company to achieve the strategic goals of each. As aforementioned, that under wholly owned subsidiary, it can be established by forming a new subsidiary from the ground or by, a, or by an existing company. Here is the example of wholly owned subsidiary in which Nike based in the US forming a new subsidiary from the ground in China. In addition, Nike manufacturing factories scattered around 42 countries in the world with the highest employees in China too. Here is another example of wholly owned subsidiary in which Facebook bought other companies and among the well-known companies that bought by Facebook are Friendster, Instagram, and WhatsApp. All these belong and own 100% by Facebook. Now for joint venture and strategic alliance, both involve in a cooperation between two or more companies but both have different goals in terms of their cooperation. The key ideas of joint venture is to create a new and separate company. Whereas, for strategic alliance, 
there is no new company or separate company created, but companies work together to increase their performance. This is to achieve mutual benefits by working together. So we can see that one with a creation of new company, where is the another one? No new company created, but mainly to increase performance. This is an example of joint venture, Sony Ericsson, which is created by Sony and Ericsson. Both companies under similar industry, which is entertainment and technology. Hence, they created Sony Ericsson in order to provide better entertainment experience to their target customer. Okay, now we have Coke, Coca-Cola and McDonald's as an example for strategic alliances. There is no new company created by these two, but they become alliances or partners and working together in the food and beverage industry. McDonald's uses Coca-Cola as its main drink in all the restaurants. Another similar example is KFC and Pepsi. Okay, to sum up, the investment entry strategy refer to which a firm invests physically in a foreign country. Therefore, the firm will have high control over its foreign operation. This is the ultimate advantage by having presence in the foreign country, which enable fast response and close observation in foreign operation. The direct investment in plant and equipment in a foreign country requires high resources, hence lead to high cost. This strategy is most costly in comparison to exporting and contractual entry strategy. Furthermore, it also has a low flexibility. This is because when they already establish and invest so much in the foreign country, it is difficult for them to quit just like that, the firm have to think a lot of things if they want to pull out from this investment. Last, investment entry strategy also entail high risk due to being exposed directly and physically in the foreign country environment, which have significant differences than on home country environment. Many foreign companies that fell in FDI are due to unable to cope and adapt to the differences in various IB environments. Here, this diagram summarizes all entry strategy that we have discussed previously. So, we can say that export entry strategy is a low level entry strategy because it has a low degree of resources required, low risk, low ownership, and also low control over foreign operation. Contractual entry strategy is a medium level entry strategy, which is higher than export entry strategy, but lower than investment entry strategy in terms of resources, risk, ownership, and control. Last, investment entry strategy is a high level entry strategy which require high resources and exposed to high risk. But with high resources and risk, this strategy allows firm to have high degree of ownership and control. In short, when we move from the low level entry strategy to the high level entry of strategy, we can see that international business involvement is getting deeper. We have discussed so many types of entry strategy. So, which one that a company should choose? Are we allowed to choose and pick whichever that we like? The answer is no. The selection of an entry strategy is very important to ensure the successfulness of the company in the foreign country. So, here in this last learning objective, we will be examining the strategic factors in selecting an entry strategy. There are two groups of factors which are internal and external factors. 
Internal factors refer to factors within the company and are under the control of the company itself. Whereas for the external factors, they are outside of the company and the company has no control at all. There are various internal factors, but here we, are, we only will be discussing a few which are firm's international experience, availability of firm resources, firm's commitment, and last, product advantages. Same for external factors, there are many, but here, few of them are foreign government regulation, risk in the foreign countries, market size and growth, as well as production and shipping costs. Now, let's see how to choose an entry strategy. Start with internal factors. We have to evaluate on each of these four factors. So first, whether a firm has an international experience or not. This is very important because without sufficient relevant experience, there tends to be a stronger sense of risk and uncertainty involved. Hence, entry strategy that has high risk, such as wholly owned subsidiary, joint venture, and strategic alliances are not advisable for the company. Second, whether the firm has plentiful resources or not. The main resources will be financial resources. Some entry strategy require high financial resources. Therefore, firm with low financial resources will be unable to commit. For an example, wholly owned subsidiary requires high financial resources to buy an existing company or to build a new company from the ground in a foreign country. Firms with unstable financial performance or low financial resources will not be able to use this entry strategy. Next, whether the firm has high commitment or not. Some entry strategy require high commitment in terms of resources, time, energy, and so on. This is because a firm has to be deeply committed in order to have greater involvement in the foreign operation. For an example, exporting has low involvement in foreign operation. So, this is suitable for firms that do not want to commit too much or too high in their international business activities and operation. Last, whether the firm's product have high advantages or not. Highly differentiated product with distinct advantages will enable firms to use more involvement entry strategy such as contractual, such as contractual and investment entry mode. In short, when a company has more yes answer than no answer for each of these aspects, all entry strategy from low to high are feasible for the company. But when a company has more no answer than yes answer of these four aspects, the most suitable entry strategy is only low level entry strategy. After the evaluation based on internal factors, firms also have to evaluate the external factors. Specifically, when the medium or high-level entry strategy are feasible based on the initial evaluation of internal factors. First and foremost, the firm have to examine whether foreign government regulation allowed certain entry strategy or not. Some countries such as China does not allow 100% foreign ownership. Therefore, wholly owned subsidiary can be used. This country have made it mandatory or compulsory for foreign firms to have a local partner. Next, whether the foreign countries have high risk. It can be in terms of political risk, economic risk or operation risk. For an example, Political instability and turmoil 
discourage firms from committing high-level entry strategy, which require more resources to a market. This is to avoid losses of assets that have been invested in the foreign country. Firms also have to examine whether the chosen countries have a large market size and growth. Country with a large market size justified high-level entry strategy that requiring high-level investment and commitment, such as wholly owned subsidiary. Last, production and shipping costs. Setting up production in a foreign country is desirable when the total cost of production is lower than on home country. In addition, high shipping costs in home country also make production more favorable in the foreign countries. This is how Nike expand to China due to low cost production in the China market. So, we have finished discussing the last part of today's topic. Let's have a quick recap on what we have covered in this topic. So, there are three categories of international entry strategies. Exporting, contractual, and investment. Under exporting, there are direct and indirect export. There are five types of contractual entry strategy, which are licensing, franchising, management and manufacturing contract, as well as turnkey project. And under investment entry strategy, there are wholly owned subsidiaries, joint ventures, and strategic alliances. Exporting is a low-level entry strategy because this entry strategy has low control over foreign operation, require low resources, and tell low risk, but has a high flexibility as the manufacturing, offices, equipment, and asset remain in the home country. Contractual is a middle-level entry strategy because all the four aspects under this entry strategy are moderate in control, resources, flexibility, and risk. Last, investment is a high-level entry strategy, also known as FDI, which a firm invests physically in a foreign market, therefore has a high control over foreign operation, require high cost in setting new foreign operation, high risk because exposed to direct and physical in the foreign markets, and this entry strategy also has low flexibility since it is difficult to quit once it has established and invested in the foreign markets. We also discussed on how to select an international entry strategy which depends on various factors. On the one hand, we have internal factors in terms of international business experience, resources available, commitments as well as product advantages. On the other hand, we have external factors such as foreign government regulation, risk, market size and growth, as well as production and shipping costs. A firm has to wait on both factors, internal and external, to determine the best entry strategy in order to expand into a foreign market. Here is the link for practices on this topic. So, that's all for now. See you in the next topic. Bye-bye.